you know, a journalist from Norway asked me, do you feel betrayed by Russians? I'm like, you know, what the f***? You know, they've been in war, in war with us for eight years. I don't feel betrayed by them. They are, they are our enemy. But I feel betrayed by Europe. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. Since the start of the war in Ukraine, we had a number of episodes about the war itself, in particular economic sanctions. But so far, we didn't have the chance to speak with actually somebody there, an Ukrainian person, and even better, an Ukrainian economist, even better, an Ukrainian top economist who lives in Kiev and is now the chair of the Kiev Economic Department and was the former Minister of Economic Development. His name is Timofey Milanovov, and uh, we are lucky to be able to catch him in between some much more important uh, issues he's dealing with in the moment. So one of the things we've talked about on this podcast before is the effectiveness of sanctions. And I was curious about why it is that the ruble is back up to pre-war levels. And I'm wondering if that has anything to do with the effectiveness of sanctions. So I guess it's a two-part question. Why is the ruble back up to pre-war levels and how effective do you think the sanctions have been so far? The ruble exchange rate has no meaning because there's no free trade in the ruble. So currently, Russian citizens are not allowed to buy US dollars. Even if they have deposits in banks, let's say they have $100,000 in a deposit, they're only allowed to withdraw 10, and the rest will be in rubles at the official exchange rate. So in that sense, if you're withdrawing money from a currency account, the lower is the exchange rate, the less the state has to pay. Similarly, because of the sanctions, there's not much import going on only critical import. What you're penalizing, you're penalizing state-owned and private companies for export with a lower exchange rate. So in other words, it's, it's a, since there's no free market and the exchange rate is not determined by supply and demand forces and there are capital controls on import, you're essentially robbing the private and state-owned companies in Russia by having a, a lower exchange rate than would be market. And also it uh, looks good for propaganda. But the fact that Russia runs a, a big kind of account surplus suggests that uh, even the freezing of central bank assets did not have a m- major impact because they keep receiving a lot of foreign currency through their continuous export of gas and, and oil. And so they have money to pay. And as long as uh, other countries like China, India are willing to sell, they, they have a market. Correct. So first, we have to separate the stock and flow. The fact that the stock is frozen is irrelevant during the war because it's cash flow that matters. Finance your critical needs, you know, you'll figure it out after the war, you know, when things settle down, some of your assets will be unrestricted. So, you know, unless the assets are confiscated and they are not, they are are restricted, then you're not really losing it. So if you want to confiscate these assets, the stock, it has to be a political decision. It cannot be a technical decision or legal decision. So it's going to take forever. Now, in terms of flow, the question is how much do you really need to finance the war? Because I'm focused on the war rather than on the economy. The idea that somehow, because of the collapse in the economy, Russians will not elect Putin in the next election seems to be a fantasy to me. You know, Or that Russia, Russian people will revolt and because McDonald's is out or because central bank reserves are frozen and they will revolt against uh, Putin, against the Kremlin, I think it's ludicrous to think that way. If anything, there will be the mobilization, and there is mobilization effect in the opposite direction. So we have a paradox there. We have tens of millions of uh, Russians denying the war and at the same time supporting it. So I don't think the economy or the economic sanctions are really about uh, forcing the opinion of people in Russia or forcing them to behave differently or creating some kind of conflict with respect to the Kremlin. 
But I think what you really need is heating equipment provided by Bosch or high precision uh, targeting equipment or software provided by some French companies to operate your tanks or missiles. And that doesn't cost that much. That doesn't cost hundreds of millions of euros. Sometimes it costs hundreds of thousands of euros or millions of euros. That, that's affordable. So you mentioned one more thing that whether you know you can bypass sanctions through China. Actually, I think it's easier to bypass them through Georgia uh, rather than through China because China is a bit worried. At least you know you know private companies which kind of uh, semi private, uh, very aligned with the government or just private companies, as long as they have some private interest, they're a little bit concerned and reluctant to trade with Russia because they have a bigger market. You know, it's not the biggest war from the perspective of those companies supplying military equipment or technology. You know, there's, there's Africa always, there's Middle East, there is Asia, there's this, uh, there's Latin America, there's North America, you know, there are bigger markets and they are risking getting secondary sanctions or sanctions, uh, you know, losing suppliers from Europe or from North America. So it's not a very good proposition. So they will be sabotaging things. So they will be supplying things, but maybe, you know, using old contracts and so on. So, I, so I, I'm more concerned about Georgia being a hotspot for bypassing sanctions rather than China, frankly. Uh, although that might not be the most uh, popular or common opinion. So I think you're correct. The sanctions are symbolic and political. They're going to work in the longer run by weakening the economy of Russia. But then there's a question of the Western resolve to maintain sanctions long enough for them to matter. And in the short run, it's really about critical imports. So would you back back to something you said, if you had to choose, and perhaps this is far too blunt a uh, simplistic way to ask, ask the question, but if you had to choose between sanctions and the supply of military equipment, the supply of necessary military equipment, which one would you pick? I would, of course, cut the supply of necessary equipment because it's, you know, if Russia can take another town, if Russia can kill another thousands or ten thousands of civilians, that in a very perverse way, they strengthen their position although it should weaken it, you know, in, in the modern world. But, it, you know, the infrastructure of the modern world, the security infrastructure is not set up that way. It actually strengthens their position. So uh, weakening it should be the objective. And, you know, I'm a little bit frustrated by NATO's inability to build a strategic capacity to weaken this ability of Russia. So, you know, Russia clearly has engaged not only Ukraine, but NATO through info ops, through cyber ops, through political ops, through corruption, through polarization. And, you know, um, it's not kinetic warfare, but it's all kinds of but kinetic warfare. You know, it takes Ukraine. Ukraine is better suited now, better positioned, let's say, to, to force Bosch or, you know, okay, German or um, French companies or some other European companies to provide critical equipment for Russia to be able to continue to run cyber ops, you know, or info ops than NATO. Because NATO doesn't have an operational mechanism, a working mechanism, to, to prevent German and French and other European companies from supplying critical technology, information or equipment to Russia, while Ukraine today has. And it's, a, of course, a political mechanism where our president or the government, the minister of foreign affairs or diplomatic channels put pressure and it's de facto sanctioning companies because they start pulling out from, from Russia. It's not the euro, but it's de facto. And I think that mechanism is working. And if I were to pick, I think that mechanism is much more important. Although everyone is talking about embargo on gas and oil, if that is to happen, then it would cut down flows, right? Not stock, but flows to something. And that would be painful. That would probably have an effect. I agree with that. But still, even then, I think the, it's much more important to identify the critical, the weakest links in supply chains where the technology Russia has would take them years to develop if they are cut off from the critical imports and make sure that they don't bypass it, don't import it through secondary market or through gray military market, which is there, unfortunately. So if you had to point out the three biggest offenders, the three Western companies that are still supplying Russia with crucial wartime stuff, that you would like to stop and have not stopped. Uh, can you name uh, three names? I'm not going to name the the companies because I do not know, or what I know is classified. But I am going to name countries. It's still France and Germany, and then uh, Georgia is facilitating 
uh, by passing sanctions. I'm glad Italy is not in the list, but it's pretty close there. No? Well, it would be would be would be number four if I went on to say uh, if I went not to say Georgia. Is there a way to think about how much of what's happening is official companies selling their products, and how much of it is the black market, and how how much can be how much of this can be reduced by pressure on corporations, and how much just is a shadow world of the black market that official pressure has no means of of, of reaching. So, you know, there is a very active military market and it's a little bit, you know, gray, uh, at least uh, grayer than uh, many other markets. It's not as, you know, it's not a dark market because most of the things you actually have to ship them and they're sizable, so they're observable. You know, it's not like cyber ops or information. You're not trading information. A, let's say WHO example, it's, which is a little bit ridiculous example where the information is flowing to Russia. Before we move on, will you just pause on the WHO example that you were going to mention? So WHO is upset that our government is not giving them information about the uh, health situation, wounded and uh, hospital needs, but they're not uh, willing to exclude Russia from WHO. And so as a member, Russia has access to this information. And somehow it doesn't click together in the bureaucrats' minds that the information about how many wounded or what are the needs of our hospitals or how many, which hospitals require renovation actually provides critical operational intelligence to Russia. Wow. In case of these things, you know, this actually equipment which is being shipped, unless it's software, and software is more difficult to track and you can just leak the code. Uh, But... uh, this is observable. This is shippable. It's usually dual purpose, and it's difficult to control dual purpose market. But there are there are expert controls, there are licensing, and there are all kinds of violations of those during wartime. It's very difficult to you know how are you going to monitor. You know, if someone ships something to Russia, how are you going to monitor whether it was shipped to a hospital or later used by a military? You know, it's impossible to monitor, right? You need you need observability. So during wartime, you lose observability. So the standard reaction there are actually protocols which prohibit. Uh, companies to trade. So, you know, you, you really have to, you know, you can't during the wartime supply of the, a lot of center things, which you would be normally supplying or allowed to buy. But then there are all the intermediary companies. There are really tons of them. Uh, and they have things in stock and they're usually in some third countries and they will supply things to you. So, the, so much discussion in the West and particularly in, in uh, the European Union about stopping the import of gas and oil from Russia. How important do you think that is for the success of Ukraine or for the defense of Ukraine, number one? And two, I read somewhere, but I might be wrong, I want to double check, is, isn't there some Russian oil or gas that is still flowing through Ukraine? Yeah, so there is gas and oil flowing through, actually, uh, pipeline Druzhba <laughs> friendship. You know, the Soviet pipeline Druzhba is through Ukraine. And we have our uh, pipeline network, and it's flowing through uh, Ukraine, and Russia is is supposed to be paying us for it. So why don't you stop it? You are at war with Russia. Why don't you stop the pipeline? It makes no sense for us to stop it, because if we stop it, it's going to be shipped through other pipelines, through other countries. Right? So it it will just... uh, paint us as an unreliable partner and will help them with their propaganda, you know, and they have tried to, to use this trick. I mean, that's not the only reason, of course, if they actually, I, I, I frankly don't think they will pay us, but, you know, some people might think, oh, yeah, they're also going to pay you, so there are some revenues, but I think it's, it's a little bit, uh, we are past that point to think about two months revenue for rental of the pipelines, you know, it's, it's, it's we're not in that business now, unfortunately for us and the world. But Russia has used that in their propaganda in 2004 during Orange Revolution and later, they were claiming that Ukraine has been stealing gas and Ukraine is not a pro, you know reliable supplier and you know we just need to bypass Ukraine and there were gas wars. If you know if we look at the headlines, every you know five seven years Russia would cut off gas to Ukraine and to Europe and then there was a question whether it's Ukraine stealing gas or Russia is not pumping enough and there would be all that. So so it's it, it, Ukraine also is a, is a country which has never defaulted despite all of this harassment and wars and annexations while Russia has defaulted in the late 90s 1998. So we're trying to keep our reputation of not defaulting on our obligations. 
that is consistent. For example, there is a blockade in the Middle East of one country blockaded another one uh, in terms of food security. Ukraine continued to supply, Ukrainian private companies continued to supply food to Middle East. And that uh, helps us. I talked to the ministers, you know, I don't want to reveal specific countries, but when I was on the government and when I was advising, I, I, spoke, I have spoken with multiple ministers in the Middle East, and they said, well, we actually have a reputation of being a reliable partner. If something happens, we don't take sides, we continue to supply. So I think there's part of that thinking, and maybe it's institutionalized. Of course, we can make a decision to stop pipelines. The question is, unless it is coupled together with embargo, it's just useless, right? Because that's gonna put strain, technological strain on our system pressure issues, you have reverse direction issues, all kinds of issues. You're stressing your own system. And so what? They will ship it through Nord Stream 1, you know. They will ship it through the South Stream. They will ship it through other streams in in case of gas. So it's not going to achieve any goal. Now, your first question was, how much does it really matter, the embargo? Well, it's not the embargo which matters, but Russia not being paid that matters. (laughs) So as far as I'm concerned, Pump all the gas you want. And I think it's a little bit of a silly discussion. Let's make sure it's being pumped. Let's just, you know, that's fine. Just make sure Russia doesn't get a penny of it until, you know, some conditions are met. And this condition better be not even stopping the war in Ukraine, but demilitarization, because it's an aggressive regime now willing to use uh, military force in Europe. Uh, and that's probably not acceptable, should not be acceptable to most people who are thinking strategically about the future of Europe. How far away on that front are we from where we need to be? I mean, if, if where we need to be is a total embargo in making sure Russia doesn't get paid for its oil and gas, where where are we and can we get from A to B? Technologically, let's think. You know, in terms of no, Russia not being paid, we can do it. You know, we can stop paying Russia while still pumping gas. It's likely that the Russia will respond to this by cutting the gas supplies, but they cannot do it forever. They will really have to start burning this gas. So, it's, you know, their reaction is, is unpredictable, but, you know, you can try. People might say I'm a hawk now, and, you know, for obvious reasons, because I'm in the country which is under war, you know, I would try it. You know, I would say, yeah, pump your gas, pump your oil. We're not paying you until ABC. How far are we politically from it? I think we're still pretty far. Central European countries, many of them, at least politicians, are still afraid. And still, not all of them, but many are still living in a fantasy world that somehow there could be some negotiation. If only Ukraine agrees not to ever join NATO, you know, no one ever offered to Ukraine in good faith. So I think politically, we're not ready for that. Now, paradoxically, it's easier politically to do the other thing, just to cut down demand and continue to pay for what's consumed. And even there, we're pretty far, but there's a serious discussion now in Europe that we should depend less on Russian energy. So while I'm on this train about energy being used as strategic weapon, Russia actually has three. And we only talk about one. Uh, Energy security is one. The other one is logistics. Some of the North China trade is going through Russia. Not all goes by sea. But even if it does, it often gets shipped through Black Sea or Mediterranean and Baltic Sea and foreign. So basically, if you destabilize the Baltic to south of Black Sea, you know, this area, which is destabilized now, the logistical costs go up and your ability to control, you know, how much destabilization you are doing gives you a lot of leverage. So that's weapon number two. And the third weapon is food security. Russia and Ukraine together supplying between quarter and 30% of wheat and corn and some other grains. Out of top 10, top five grains, you know, at least two thirds are Russia and Ukraine. They're not immediately being supplied to the EU. And, you know, I've seen people say things like, oh, you know, it doesn't really matter because uh, there'll be a bit of inflation, but the EU and North America won't be affected by this food security issue if Russia kicks out Ukraine from the market and will become a local monopolist. It's not going to be a big deal. You know, it's not going to be a big deal, except that it matters for North Africa for Middle East and some of the Asian countries. And you don't want to have their Russia with another tool where it now can create food shortages in Middle East and uh, Northern Africa. That's going to destabilize the region when they want it destabilized, or at least put some pressure. So, you know, if they kick out Ukraine from the food security map, and currently 
385 million people in the world, in this region, depend for food security on Ukraine. That's about 5% of the world population. That's a big deal because you can create a lot of destabilization in those parts of the world. And Russia has been using it strategically, as we have seen it in Syria, right, to get leverage against through refugee crises and other, you know, other elements to get a seat at the table in some discussions and uh, have something to bargain for. So it's in the interest, strategic interest of Russia to destabilize the region for logistics and to kick out Ukraine from the food supply chain. So it has uh, it can have local monopoly. So that's two additional weapons to to energy. Now you you are a game theorist, mechanism design economist, right? And uh, now you're facing the the challenge of a lifetime. How to start thinking strategically about a negotiation for a peace and and, and, and la- hopefully a peace that will last. So how do you think about these topics? Uh, you. A strategy of conflicts, of course, and game theory conflict, and uh, uh, it uh, it tells you you have to be strong to be able to deter. You can deter by com- compliance or by being kind of weak. So you know, in an emotional world, you can deter by saying, you know, I'm not challenging you. But in a game theoretic world, you actually have to create very strong incentives not to escalate, and that means commitment to punishment. And so what you know, some of uh, the Western countries, including the US were doing, they were committing not to do something. They say, no matter what, we're not gonna put boots on the ground. Well, you know, that's really wrong from the perspective of game theory. You might not be willing to do that, but you don't announce it. <laughs> so on the things you are not planning to do, on the threats you are not planning to execute, you're saying, I don't know, I might or might not. You're staying ambiguous. So, you know, think of how you're talking to a child. You're saying, you know, I'm not going to tell you how I'm going to punish you if you're going to eat more candy, you know. Okay, the kid is going to eat more candy. So I think the West has got it wrong or forgot what the Cold War was. You know, Cold War was about essentially deterrence where there is commitment to act. You need to, you, you need, it's counterintuitive as often as in game theory. You have to escalate to de-escalate. You have to commit to escalate in order to create incentives not to escalate. Now, in terms of what's happening right now in the theater, you know, it looks like history is a better predictor than our logic because we are denying our our rationality somehow by compounding this with wishful thinking that we're living in a different world. We're hoping that people cannot be that nasty, but they are that nasty. We're hoping that people are not going to shoot at uh, nuclear facilities. We're hoping that people are not going to dig trenches in uh, Chernobyl but they are. We're hoping they're not gonna shell civilians or they're not gonna execute civilians, but they do. We're hoping they're not gonna bomb Kiev, but they do, you know? So all assumptions we, we have, they have been falsified. So in my view, Russia is gonna push as far as it is given, you know, as far as it can. So the way to stop it is actually to have a number of decisive losses for Russia that it will be forced to withdraw. But I don't think anything is going to happen until both sides can declare some sort of victory. So there should be a decisive ba- battle. Clearly, it was, Kiev was not that. Uh, Mariupol is not going to be that either. So a lot of people right now are hoping that the next battle for Donbass, which is starting already, probably starting, but it's starting in two, three, four days or in several days, just before you know May 9th or May 8th, the, end, you know, the symbolic date of the end of the war with Germany. For Russia, at least, it's a very symbolic. So there is there's going to be a battle for Donbass, and this battle for Donbass somehow, if it is you know if both sides could claim victory there, both Ukraine and Russia, then there is a possibility for some kind of you know settlement. But fundamentally, the settlement could be of three types. You know, I'm I'm thinking very technically here. Ukraine will lose territory. Ukraine will have the same as in 2014 territory or it will gain some territory back. So if it's gonna lose territory, it's just another pause, an episode, it just was a bad luck. Uh, Russia tried, this time it still got some additional territory, but maybe not as much as in case of Crimea and at a higher cost, but it's still working, you know? So they will attempt again. If Ukraine gains some of the territory back, now Ukraine really poses a threat to Russia. And then if Ukraine doesn't gain and Russia doesn't gain any territory back, so we're basically back to 2014, then there is some hope for stability. 
at least temporary stability. So I think that's the best the world can hope for, in my view. But nonetheless, even if that happens, we have a problem that there is a very aggressive regime, non-democratic, with maybe 40 to 80 million people out of 140, their population are supporting aggressive, uh, you know, supporting military action to reach their unclear goals, because it's unclear what their goal in Russia is, or sorry, Russian goal in Ukraine is. It's unclear what they're trying to achieve. Are they trying to take Mariupol? No, they destroyed it. Are they trying to take Kiev? No, they are not taking Kiev. You know, what is it that they're trying to cut to, to Odessa? No, they are not. You know, what is that? It's unclear what their objective is, actually. And even though 40 to 80 million people really, you know, however you devise their polls, are actively supporting the war, that's a problem for Europe. That's a very unstable situation. That means there will be continuation of hostilities. Maybe they'll try to cut to Kaliningrad. Maybe they'll be doing something in Moldova. Maybe something in Georgia. Who knows? You know, they'll be doing something, maybe in Syria. So essentially, I think we will have to wait uh, for Russia to implode and watch uh, how we can decouple the aggressive regime in Russia from nuclear weapons. And that's going to be a challenge for the next couple of decades for the world. Are there things that have surprised you if the West has been naive or the West has forgotten some of the lessons of the Cold War that perhaps we should have we should have learned? Are there things that have surprised you as you've watched this unfold from where you sit? So two things surprised me in Russia would surprise me how many people support the war. Truly, you know, I I don't believe the polls, but I still believe a lot of people support the war. To me, this is really scary. It's not the Kremlin, which is scary, but the fact that Tens of millions of people are supporting killing civilians and massa. That is really scary in the 21st century. That is something I thought we left in 20th century. I can see how governments become nasty. I can see how there are dictators. I can see how there are things like ISIS, ideological terrorist organizations, you know, destroying culture and destroying humanity. But I have not seen it institutionalized at the state level in the 21st century. And now I do, and we haven't seen yet the wars. We just see the dynamics that they started with, you know, Georgia later, well, they start with Chechnya, but the, later there was Georgia and they bombed Georgia. Then there was uh, Syria and the, the, before that there was Crimea. And, the, and now there is Ukraine as the country, but it's getting worse and worse. It's progressing that business. That is really scary. And, you know, they're bombing the cities in which they had most of the support. They're bombing Kharkiv, they're bombing Mariupol. These are the cities in which, you know, all our previous analysis with which I disagree, but anyway, claims their largest share of the Russian people. That's what they're bombing. You know, they're bombing their own, you know, kind of electoral base potential. So it doesn't really matter if it's Ukraine or something else. It doesn't matter. So that is really surprising for me. How is it that I missed it? You know, I, 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 I had no, no illusion about how nasty Putin is oh, and his God. bodies. But how did I miss? How did I miss that there are, you know, 80 million people that nest? That's a disease, and that's really scary. The second one is I really can't believe how weak the European response is and how it's not serious it is. That is, you know, I'm not surprised there. I'm really frustrated. You know, I, I had a question, someone asked me earlier, a question which almost insulted me. You know, a journalist from Norway asked me. Do you feel betrayed by Russians? I'm like, you know, what the f***? You know, they've been in war in war with us for eight years. I don't feel betrayed by them. They are, they are our enemy. But I feel betrayed by Europe, that we're not getting <laughs> arms, that for the first week, everyone f- felt that, okay, you know, they're just going to collapse now, you know? So, you know, let's wait and see what happens. <laughs> so that's, that's why I feel betrayed. And then that they still choose economy over humanity. And the price will be high for them too, just not now. We also tried that in Ukraine, you know. For 20 years, we were Russia subsidized by, you know, our gas was 10 times less than the market price. See where it got us? Not far. So I think, um, you know, the same principle is at work there. So I'm surprised by these two things, fundamentally. Tim, I think you uh, run, run out of uh, the time you allocated us and we don't want to okay. extend our welcome because uh, we know we are, okay. you have a very busy day. But let me ask uh, uh, one last question, because one thing that really surprised everybody, you, you said what surprised you, what surprised everybody in the West is the quality of Zaleski leadership. <clears throat> the image we had of Ukraine was of a country 
that wasn't working particularly well, that was corrupt, that was not working. What did we miss? Uh, what is the secret that brought Ukraine together to this success? So, you know, I think uh, intellectual arrogance, you know, not willing to pay attention to the detail. Uh, we all studied in the West Russia. We forgot to study Ukraine. Uh, it was all about Russia, what Putin thinks, what uh, Navalny said. You know, no one has been trying to understand Zelensky or Poroshenko or their dynamics. Or the history. And, you know, if you really look at it carefully, there's no, this escalation is no surprise because, you know, Zelensky is his second year in the office. Okay, soon it will be third, but it's his second year. And so first year he wasn't challenged by pro-Russian oligarchs, but in the second year he got challenged. And what was his response? He put Medvedchuk, who is a relative or, you know, connected to Putin, under house arrest. And so what did Russia do? They started an energy war. Of course, we missed it, but, you know, it was there. It was in the news. What did Zelensky do? Got through it. Russia put some troops in April 2021, 100K, 120K. What did Zelensky do? He didn't budge. An inner circle person of Zelensky gets assassinated unsuccessfully, but Shafir was driving in August to the office of the president and he was shot at. That was a clear message. What happens? Zelensky doesn't budge. So the escalation was much more gradual and Zelensky's resilience to pressure was obvious. We talked about the oligarchization where he actually took on all oligarchs in Ukraine simultaneously. Yeah, people are accusing him of connections with Kolomoisky, but I don't think there is evidence that Kolomoisky is somehow you know, faring much better than anyone else in Ukraine. So Zelensky really is, you know, has been fighting oligarchs and not giving space to Russia in negotiations at the same time. It's somehow not surprising that he's shown leadership like that. And then if you look at Ukraine, you know, this is the only Slavic country, you know, post-Soviet Union Slavic country, which successfully resisted uh, multiple attempts at uh, dictatorship or authoritarian governments in, uh, being installed. You know, Belarus lost the case, Russia lost the case, but uh, Ukraine had two revolutions to kick out Yanukovych, essentially. So, you know, there's history in, you know, recent history in people believing in the fact that, and, you know, the last revolution, it cost people's lives, right? And there was invasion in the East and Crimea was annexed. And people were shot. By our own government, people were shot downtown Kiev. And still, protesters didn't disperse. More died. And the government toppled. So, you know, Ukraine, Ukrainian people have this history of succeeding. They believe it, it, you know, the life is dark, but if they push hard enough, there will be a sunrise after that. So not everyone will see it, but it will happen. We, it's not new for us. So 2014 taught us the price. So, you know, what, what surprised me most in 2014, not in 2022. In 2014, my, most, my main surprise was that I realized that the price of democracy is, is paid in lives, that every country has to pay it in, in human lives, like the U.S. paid 100 years ago, like Europe paid it 100 years ago, 100 years ago. We have to pay it too. We just don't inherit it after the Soviet Union collapsed. And we're willing to pay this price, unfortunately, for people who die. And uh, other, you know, other countries like Russia and Belarus are not willing to do it. So I think, I, I think that you know, if had people studied it, they would have understood this, that it's going to get to that. That was amazing. Thank you very much. And, and good luck to you and all your family and all and your country. Yes, good luck to you. Thank you very much. Can I pitch one thing in the end? Sorry, you know, I Please. have to kind of leverage it. Guys, you know, we raised $17 million at the Kiev School of Economics to buy mostly medical kits. Medical kits are important. You you all seen the news today at Kramators where, you know, people were trying to evacuate and uh, Russians just bombed uh, the train station. That's how most people die because in the first minutes, if they don't stop losing blood, they die. So, you know, we're supplying thousands, tens of thousands of medical kits, which are designed specifically to stop blood loss and can be applied by people, self-applied. Essentially, a police officer can be, or a medic can be throwing 20 of them at the same time to the crowd and people will, you know, it's like masks in the airplane when uh, the cabin is depressurized. So we're supplying them, it's not easy, they cost a hundred bucks a piece. We have been raising tons of money 
If you know anyone who can support that effort, please do. You know, if you can put any of this in the podcast, I appreciate it. I'll send you a link. Uh, it's uh, to, yeah, maybe you can promote. If not, that's fine too. No, no, no please send us the link. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you want to donate, this is the link. K-S-E dot U-A backlash we dash save dash lives. What did you find to be the most surprising thing he said, Luigi, since part of the theme of this interview are, is things that surprised us? What did, what did you find most surprising? Many things. The first is that uh, we in the West, and particularly we Europeans, feel like we are congratulating ourselves for how well we have done, what we're doing, how pro-Ukraine we are, and uh, we even like shun everybody who has any f vague uh, resemblance with uh, a, a Russian supporter and so on and so forth. Seen from his perspective, we're doing terribly. And, uh, and I think that uh, to me, it was very moving when he said that uh, there will be a sunrise, but not everybody will see it. But the price is the, in the, of democracy is measuring human lives. I think that that's, uh, uh, and that's not uh, empty rhetoric uh, from somebody who is driving to Kiev tomorrow. It's also interesting, his response, that the reason we all <laughs> we all missed how strong Ukraine would be was, was intellectual arrogance. And I suppose there is, in all the celebratory comments about the wonderful Ukrainians, there is a little bit of condescension, right? There is, a, there is an attitude of, oh, look at them. We didn't think they could do it. And I can see how that could, especially given, given, this, given, given the history there, I can see how that could be actually insulting. Yeah, and, and uh, many years ago, I saw this movie, uh, Fog of War, with John McNamara, in the interview to John McNamara, and he said that uh, if, if he had understood how much the Vietnamese hated the Chinese, he would have conducted the war in a completely different way. And so maybe one theme here is we need to study history better, and we need to teach history better, because uh, I think that uh, this misunderstanding are uh, dramatic in terms of cost. You can't learn that lesson too many times about the benefits of, of history. And I was struck in his comments, his response to your excellent question about game theory, his comments about how we do seem to have forgotten some of the lessons of, of, of the Cold War. And perhaps I, I was wondering if it's living in this information age where where we, we tell people too much <laughs> instead of saying, instead of keeping it a secret that we've decided not to do something, we don't know where to draw the, draw the lines on information anymore. And I wondered if that's a broader, a broader or it's hard, I don't mean broader. There's nothing broader or more important than the war right now. But but if that's a if, if that's a human issue in the, the information age that we don't know when to be quiet, we don't know where to draw the lines around information. And uh, you know, as an economist, he reasoned also in terms of a uh, uh, market monopoly and threat that this market monopoly can bring. And one of the aspects that I did not consider is. With Ukraine outside of the picture, it's not only there is a shortage of wheat, but there is an incredible market power of Russia in destabilizing uh, the rest of the world. Because if you just cut out the supply of wheat, the entire Middle East might go in flame. Now I understand why, for example, Israel has been incredibly soft-spoken in all this uh, negotiation and not taken side very aggressively because they know they're sitting on top of a ticking bomb. And it seems that Russia has the combination to activate that bomb. The issue, not just of food security, but of food weaponization. And I thought that was fascinating. We've, we've talked and seen pieces about food security and about the percentage of wheat that comes from Russia and, and Ukraine. But I had not thought of that. <laughs> I still tend to, I guess, have boxes in my mind and think, well, food is humanitarian. Food isn't a weapon. But of course it can be a weapon. And I thought that was that that opened my mind to a possibility. I'm not sure I'm glad my mind is open to this this possibility. It's one more one more thing to worry about. But that that was not something that I had thought about um, until his comments. 
Antitrust policy has reached what appears to be an inflection point. Will it lead to once-in-a-generation changes? Join Chicago Booth Stigler Center virtually for a conference exploring what's next for antitrust policy. It's April 21st and 22nd. Register to watch the live stream at chicagobooth.edu slash Stigler Antitrust 22. That's S-T-I-G-L-E-R-A-N-T-I-T-R-U-S-T T-W-E-N-T-Y-T-W-O. We're all struggling to make sense of the war. We're all struggling to make sense of, of who saw it coming, who, who didn't see it coming, how we could have ended up here. And I thought his comments were incredibly crystallizing about not, not expecting to see some of the things we've seen in the 21st century. And we all think of naivete as being a bad thing. And in some ways it, it is, but naivete is also delightful. And I, I would have preferred to have stayed naive to the, the, the fact that people in warfare is no better than it, than it, than it ever was. That for all the advances that we've made, people are as ugly in war as, as, as they ever were. Yeah, I think that that's, that's very sombering. And it's very sombering the fact that you do see a massive amount of people supporting this brutality against people that they consider their brothers. Sometimes they may speak the same language and they have a long history in common. So how can you be so, uh, so brutal? I think that that is the question. The other is in the United States, we tend to reduce everything to the villain and Putin is the villain. And if only Putin were to disappear tomorrow, the world would be a better place. And unfortunately, it's not true. The other thing he said that I found really interesting, which I want to mention, was his point about how Ukraine taking territory, the, this sort of three scenario, um, these three scenarios that he laid out, where Ukraine loses territory, it remains even, Ukraine takes territory. And that he, a Ukrainian, you would have expected him to say, we, we get territory out of this. But he doesn't, because he sees it through the historical lens and sees the danger it would cause um, with Russia or Ukraine to come out of this with, with more territory. And it's I thought that was incredibly wise of him and an interesting um, interesting ability for, for intellect to override emotion. Absolutely. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to Capital Isn't wherever you get your podcasts.